Okay, hello everybody, good afternoon, good morning and good evening to those in Australia as well. Um, thanks to the organisers for allowing this virtual Nicholls Symposium to go ahead for more. Um, so my name is Will, I'm a PhD student at Cardiff University and my talk is titled Up Close and Personal with the Marinsky Reef. I'm going to be sharing a few high resolution element maps of the Marinsky Reef from several localities in the western lobe of the Bushford complex. And the format of my talk, what we're going to do is I'm going to highlight some of the key observations that we've made in these samples from the base to the top of the Marinsky cyclic unit uh, and talk about uh, the kinds of interpretations that we've made from these observations uh, and what this may have implications for for the formation of the Marinsky Reef. Um, so there's not many in the crowd that will need an introduction to the Bushfield complex. So the, uh, let me just remove my face. It's high on the screen. So the diagram to the left shows the different lobes of the Bushfield complex and all the samples we've acquired are from the Western lobe, from the Northern Impala, Rustenburg and Karee mines. The hand specimen to the left is a specimen collected from the Rustenburg mine. It is around 26 centimetres in length, around one centimetre in thickness, and it nicely shows the different lithotypes of the Marensky cyclic unit. So from base to the top, I'll try and get a laser pointer actually. All right, options. Oh, I can't see it. No, well. Anyway, from the base to the top, we have the footwall norite or olivine norite in the case of Northern, overlain by the footwall and northosite, the lower chromatite, the central pyroxenite, which is in some cases pegmatoidal, the upper chromatite, and the hanging wall pyroxenite. What's interesting about this particular sample is we see a dramatic change in the thickness of the lower chromatite, uh, where it appears to thicken up against what seems to be a, a pothole like structure penetrating downward into the footwall. And we'll have a closer look at that in a moment. So the first images I want to share, these are micro XRF images from the footwall olivine norite at Northern, consists of plagi clays with olivine oikocrysts and uh, orthoperoxine overgrowths on these olivine oikocrysts. Uh, chromite is very rare, but it is present in the footwall olivine norite at Northern. It's not present in the norites at Rustenburg and Impala and other maps that we've looked at. The sulfide component, which is what we're seeing in light green there, is distributed throughout the plagi clays component. What I really want to highlight in this particular map is these orthopyroxene overgrowths around these olivine oikocrysts. And if we look a bit closer, what we may see is that the orthopyroxene overgrowths are slightly thicker on the upper margins of these olivine oikocrysts. So I'll circle a few as I speak now, and there's an enhanced image to the right there. And what we believe this may indicate is that uh, we've had some sort of reactive porous flow, so downward reactive porous flow of a silica-rich melt, preferably interacting with the upper margins of these olivine oikocrysts. And this is something that we've noticed in not just this sample, but also other samples from Northern as well. So moving to the next observation is the compositions of plagioclase, uh, more specifically in the footwall and northern site and the olivine norites and norites. Um, so particularly at Northern Impala, we see the subtle reverse oscillatory zoning in the element map. So we can see a slightly more arbitic core and a slightly more anorthitic rim of these samples. Um, so we also, could, we also acquired a spectrum through the footwall uh, norite and the, and the footwall and north site of the Rustenburg sample to see if there was sort of a, a wholesale change in calcium as we approached the reef contact. Uh, and what we saw from the spectrum is that there was actually no complete change in calcium across the footwall, uh, which indicates that actually this subtle reverse oscillatory zoning is perhaps more in keeping with the leaching of alkalis, perhaps by interaction with fluid rather than melting, since a lot of models currently indicate the anorthite may be a rest site of melting, which this data may not indicate that. So the next thing I want to spend a bit more time on is the textures of chromite that we're seeing, and more specifically in this sort of spectacular slab from Rustenburg that we've got. Um, what you may notice initially is that knife sharp contact between the lower chromite and the footwall and north site. Um, I should sort of spot check. So dark blue is uh, plagi clays, light blue is clonoperoxine, dark green here is orthoperoxine and orange is, is the chromite. What you see is that uh, clonoperoxine penetrates a centimetre or two into the footwall and north site. And we also see these sort of highways of sulphide uh, that percolate downward through the north site and then are draped over the top of the norite. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. What we may see from looking at the chromite is that we see a thickening of the chromite up against this uh, where the pegmatoid thickens and penetrates slightly downward in the footwall and north site. This may be indicative of some form of granular flow. We also see the contact between the uh, central pyroxenite and the lower chromatite is, is undulations around a few centimetres in length undulations. 
and the upper con and the upper chromatite, I should say, has quite lower diffuse boundaries where hosted by plagioclase. However, when the chromites are hosted by orthopyroxene, we see quite compact chromite as well. I would like to highlight as well, so this is the same sample, but both sides of that sample. So we're actually looking at a change in the textures of the reef over around a centimetre or so. And what we see is that from this sample, we see these undulations somewhat aligning with these diffuse lower boundaries hosted by plagioclase in here. Whereas in the sample just the other side, in the map from just the other side, we see that the upper chromatite is connected to the lower chromatite by these isthmus of chromite as well. So what this may look like is perhaps the separating of one chromite here into two. I think it's definitely worth something exploring in the future as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom slightly into both of these maps to have a more detailed look at the textures of chromite grains. So looking essentially at the lower margin of the lower chromatite, what we can see is that chromites at the bottom of this margin hosted by plagioclase show these vermiform or dendritic textures, something that's been noted by a few recent uh, publications as well. Whereas when hosted by clonoperoxine, uh, the chromite grains are slightly more annealed or amoeboidal. Um, and what we believe this is indica indicative of is supercooling at this contact as well, and perhaps differential crystal uh, growth rates in these as well. And I think Steve may have published on this recently as well. Uh, so quite spectacular. So I'll, I'll let that one sit there so people can take, take those images in uh, a bit more. Okay, great. And another thing we started to notice is, uh, is the amount of phlogopite that we're starting to see in these rocks. So these element maps are maps from uh, the olivine norite at Northern. Uh, we, this is one of the olivine orthoperoxine crystals that we saw in the first slide. Um, so what we're seeing is that phlogopite does seem to align parallel with one another around the margins of these olivine orthoperoxine overgrowths, as well as those that are hosted in the plagioclase component of these maps as well. And they appear to force some spatial relationship with sulfide, which also appears to dust the outlines of these olivine orthoperoxine overgrowths as well. This is on a, a grain scale, but on a larger scale of these element maps, we actually see that phlogopite shows this alignment uh, um, ten to tens of centimetres as well. So as we can see, the phlogopite is sort of aligning uh, northeast to southwest of this particular sample. It is particularly concentrated around the margins of these olivine orthoproxene crystals, but we do see that same alignment in the plagioclase component of the footwall norites as well. Um, this perhaps is indicative of direction of uh, flow of residual melt or fluid, perhaps, uh, in these rocks. Um, I've been interacting with the olivine norites. So now we're going to zoom in. This is a little yellow box here, and we're going to zoom into an element map there. So what we're looking at now is what we believe may represent melt inclusions. So firstly, this is the, uh, the box we've just zoomed into. So this is what we believe is a melt inclusion hosted in olivine in the football olivine norite at Northern. Consists primarily of albite, uh, purple phlogopite, we also have chlorapatite with four to five weight percent chlorine, sulfide, and also some zircon as well. Uh, this is not something we've just seen in the olivine norite at Northern. Here is a slightly lower resolution, it's yet to be mapped at higher resolution, melt inclusion that we believe exists in an orthoperoxene oikocryst in the central pyroxenite at Rustenburg. It's a lot of moving, but um, hopefully you can keep up with the changes of samples. Uh, but essentially, it consists of the same components, albite, phlogopite, chlorapatite with 4 to 5 percent chlorine, and also sulfides as well. So we believe the amount of phlogopite and the amount of melt inclusions does indicate the presence of water at the time of crystallization of these units. Uh, however, we should, should note uh, cautiously that not much amphibol has been observed in these maps yet, but further studies, um, we can hopefully try and resolve this a bit more. So I've alluded to the spatial relationship between sulfite and phlogopite in the previous slides. So I just want to really hit that one home in this particular slide. So here's a thin section map of the upper chromatite from uh, the slab in Rustenburg. So orange is chromatite, green is rutile, uh, yellow is sulfide and purple is phlogopite. And what we noticed initially is that the, the upper chromatite is lined on the upper and lower margins by phlogopite. This is something I don't think has been observed uh, in the upper chromatite before. So this is a really interesting observation. And outside of the chromatite, where we see phlogopite, it is consistently in direct contact with sulfide, both, both in the hanging wall pyroxenite and also in the central pyroxenite. And we can extend that relationship as well to the lower chromatite. So now we've moved to impala mine. And purple is phlogopite, now yellow is chromatite, just to keep you on your toes and red is sulfide. And we can see that actually where we see phlogopite, sulfide is always either in direct contact or just adjacent to it as well. And I'll, and I'll circle a few examples of that um, just as I'm speaking now. 
Okay. So this may be indicative of a high residual melt at time of sulfur percolation in this, and perhaps the phlogopite on the upper chromatite represents a product of perhaps some reaction. I think this is something that we've only acquired in the last month or so, so this definitely requires some further investigation to see if this is just an anom anomaly or if this is something that we're seeing in more samples. So that brings us nicely onto the distribution of sulfide in these samples. So again, we're back to that spectacular Rustenberg sample here. Um, some basic statistics through this particular sample from both sides, looking at the modal abundances of base metal sulfides. We can see that the central pyroxenite has the largest volume of sulfide, but actually the modal abundances of each sulfide is, is fairly consistent throughout this particular unit. What we can see is that we can see sulfide percolates downward through the anorthosite and then is draped over the norite. I think I alluded to that in a previous slide. And we also see concentration of sulfide in the base of this, this pothole-like structure I've outlined in previous slides as well. So what this says to us is that sulfide percolated through a partially molten anorthosite, but then was draped over the norite that was solidified at time of sulfide percolation. And this enhanced image to the right is what we're seeing is, is an enhanced image of this sort of sulfide highway that meanders downward through the foot wall and north side. I should note, obviously, a green is charcoal pyrite, sorry, pink is pentlandite, and the dark blue is pyrotite melt. Okay. So on the final observation, I'm going to outline to people as well, is the uh, distribution of platinum, platinum group minerals in the Rustenberg sample as well. So these white ellipses outline different platinum PGM identified in this particular sample. And as we can see, they're, they're scattered throughout, but they are most concentrated in, in the reef itself. Um, where we do see platinum PGM, it is either always in direct contact or just adjacent uh, to base metal sulfides as well. And the majority of platinum PGM identified consists of the two grains that are actually enhanced in this image here. So we're looking at this area here, where we can see it just adjacent in two-dimensional uh, view, I should say, or in direct contact with base metal sulfides as well. And this is something that we're seeing in this sample and also in others, I believe. Um, okay, I think that's everything. Okay, so I've given everyone a whistle-stop tour of some of these element maps. Um, I just want to sort of go over some of the observations that we've made and, and the ideas of, of what this may mean, hopefully to spark some debate with everybody. Um, so firstly, I shared the orthoperoxine jackets on the upper margin of olivine, and we perhaps thought this was indicative of downward reactive porous flow of a silica-rich melt. Uh, we saw there's no overall calcium change in the football, uh, but we do see subtle reverse oscillatory zoning in plagiar clays, which we've ascribed to the leaching of alkalis over wholesale melting of this unit. Uh, we saw the chromite textures, those vermiform or dendritic chromites at the base, which we believe is indicative of supercooling or in-situ growth. Uh, we saw the thickening of the chromite against the lee side of that pothole-like structure, which we've described to some, perhaps some sort of granular flow. And we also saw those that undulatory contact and, and also those chromite tree-like structures as well, which maybe is indicative of the splitting of one layer, I'm not too sure. Uh, sword phlogopite and melt, melt inclusions, I say not melting inclusions. Uh, fluid, perhaps indicative of fluid rich intercumulus melt or reaction products, perhaps for that phlogopite on the chromite, but it hopefully it does indicate the presence of water at the time of chromite crystallization. Perhaps it'd be worth looking at water content in pyroxene or something like this. Uh, we saw those sulfide highways uh, percolating, meandering downward through the north site and then being draped over a solidified norite. And then we saw the occurrence of platinum PGM at the margins of base metal sulfides, which perhaps uh, where they've been spatially removed from the sulfides, it could be perhaps resorption of the sulfides themselves or perhaps site mobilization of a PGA rich melt. I think it's definitely worth exploring further. So this has been uh, more maps, there's more detail, more maps in a publication that should be coming out fairly soon. So hopefully I'll share that uh, with everybody via the MagSalt email uh, soon. So thank you. <laughs>